Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel on UCTV. It's a real pleasure to continue in the series of presentations and discussions around autism. I'm with uh, Dr. Jonathan Sabat uh, today. He's the director of the Beister Center for Psychiatric Genomics, and he's very interested in the changes in DNA that are characteristic of developmental disorders that lead to changes in brain and specifically to changes in behavior. So, uh, Jonathan, welcome to the program. We're excited to hear what you have to say, but let's start by helping our viewers understand what the genome is and how you study it. Sure. The human genome is the blueprint for the development of the fetus, the child, the middle school student, and the adult. And what the genome does is it encodes all of the machinery for the development of, of the human and the continued physiology. And the reason why the genome is important is because it's loaded with genetic variation, it's loaded with mutations, and it is those variations that significantly influence human health and particularly risk for psychiatric and developmental disorders. So in many ways, you're saying we are our DNA. In a way, that uh, blueprint, if you will, defines really who we are at many different levels throughout our life. Absolutely. The, the genes carry a huge influence on human health, but they also control how the human interacts with their environment. So when people say that disease is a combination of genes and environment, that's absolutely true, but the genes have a big role. And I would guess that <clears throat> as we learn more about the genome, we're learning that environment impacts the genome uh, in a very direct way. So even though it's the nature-nurture question that we're trying to puzzle through, we know that nature is very important and in fact that nurture may impact nature. That's absolutely true. Uh, obviously environmental exposures can actually introduce mutations into the genome which can influence development. Similarly, uh, the environment can uh, contribute to epigenetic changes that could influence one's physiology. So these are, not, these are not variations that were carried by the individual when they were born, but are acquired. Right. So how do we study the genome? What do we do when we ask the question, I wonder if a gene is responsible for what I see in this child? So, the ways you identify genetic causes of disease are evolving rapidly. And for example, the way it was done routinely in the 90s was through a method we call linkage analysis, where you uh, look at variations at many places around the genome, and then you look at how those variations track with disease in an individual family. That was a really useful tool for identifying what we call Mendelian diseases, diseases that are either recessive or dominant and which obey those, those expectations mm -hmm. in, in the way they travel through families. Uh, the trick is most disease is not Mendelian. It doesn't behave that way. And so for, for a couple of decades, there was a real challenge in how to attack the genetics of these more complex diseases. And the technologies that have really proved to be game changers in identifying the genetic causes are new technologies for directly detecting mutations in the genome. So now you can look at an entire genome of a child and their mother and their father and identify all the variations and look specifically for things that disrupt genes that are involved in embryonic development, for example. But if there are a lot of variants, and even if you have mom and dad's DNA and the baby's DNA or the child's DNA, there's still a lot of looking to do before you really understand what variant might be responsible. Can you talk more about that? So that's absolutely true. When you sequence the genome of a family, you'll detect more than four million variants in mom, dad, and the child. The question is how do you narrow the search window down to the things that are likely to be pathogenic? And the approach that's proven to be particularly effective recently is the approach where you look at mom, dad's entire genome and compare that to the child and focus on what we call the spontaneous mutations or de novo mutations. As we're beginning to learn, those are significant contributors to neurodevelopmental disorders. So when you identify a new mutation 
in a child with autism, for example, and you compare the child with autism to their typically developing sibling, you're, you're seeing now a significantly higher frequency of these de novo mutations in the kids with autism compared to uh, typically developing children. Let's talk about autism and, and the causes, the genetic causes of autism. Sure. You know, <clears throat> 20 years ago, uh, we were just learning that autism was relatively prevalent, trying to figure out why the prevalence was increasing. Now we're at a point where we've really identified genes that are changed and that therefore are likely causative of autism. Talk about the genetics of autism. That's true. So we've known since the 90s that autism is genetic, that genes play a major role. But for a couple of decades, this, there was not a lot of success in identifying those genes. And that really fostered some doubt in the autism community as to uh, whether it was true that autism was genetic. Uh, a, a clinician might tell a parent when they receive their diagnosis of autism, we know that autism is genetic, but we don't understand how it works. And, and the mom might think to herself, yeah, autism probably has a genetic basis, but it's maybe not genetic in my family because autism doesn't run in my family. Mm -hmm. And because you weren't finding genes, there was no way to, to really tell parents this is how it works. And so now that the key innovation has been the sequencing technologies that allow us to identify these de novo mutations, and now we're starting to see them occurring frequently in specific places in the genome, in specific genes. And we now have dozens of genes that are now unequivocally linked to autism. So now we can say this mutation is a cause of autism. Your child carries a mutation in the gene chromodomain 8 or the gene dirk one a or uh, FMR1, MECP2. There's a whole series of genes now where you can actually even in a research study, we can take a series of genetic findings and we can report them back to the primary care physician and they can report them to the family. And now the family knows this is the genetic contributor, one of the major genetic contributors in my child. So I can imagine the confusion parents might have. They, the father might say, it doesn't run in my family. Mother might say, it doesn't run in my family. And, and what we're hearing is that A, it may not be so easy to detect it running in your family, but B, that some of these are brand new mutations. So when the doctor approaches the parents and says, look, we've done all this work to figure out what the genetic basis is, and we found a gene, and here it is, what's the reaction the family has to that information? So we're routinely taking the, the findings that are designated as, uh, you know, according to clinical guidelines, these are reportable variants, and we're giving those back to the primary care physicians. And the responses of the families that we get is almost universally relief. Mm. Often these are families who have been going from specialist to specialist trying to understand what's wrong. And from a clinical standpoint, it's not obvious. A child may have epilepsy, a child may have repetitive behaviors, they may have social difficulties, they may have difficulties concentrating in school. That is n not a diagnosis that tells you really what's wrong. Right. And then when you actually have, this is the gene, the major gene that contributed in this patient, suddenly things are a lot more clear to the family and, and they have an answer that they can begin to understand. And, that yeah, brings, brings relief. And I, yeah, I think the, the relief might also come, I'm just putting myself in their shoes, the relief might come from understanding that there was no way they could possibly have known that this change was there. In fact, maybe this is a new change that doesn't occur in their genome. It's out of the clear blue sky. There's no sense in which there's guilt attached to it. It's just, thank goodness, we know that there's a gene that can explain that. That's true, and it's, it's also very helpful to know when it's a de novo mutation, that very often when, when you observe that in the patient, it, it does give you a sense, give you, give you an indication that there isn't a high risk mm. of that mutation happening again. And so that would obviously, from a clinical genetics, genetic counseling standpoint, the family um, can get new information about what are the chances of having another child with autism. It's very helpful, very, very helpful at a clinical <laughs> level. Um, 
Okay, so now I've got a, a gene that I've identified in, in uh, this young, young boy. What do I do now? I'm the doctor. What, what therapy do I have to, uh, to prescribe for this, for this youngster? That's a really important question. And one of the challenges that we face is that some of the most frequent mutations, some of the mutations that we see most often in patients, don't always point you to an obvious treatment or to an obvious druggable pathway. Genes like chromodomain 8 and DERK1A um, play a major role in controlling development and physiology, and there, there aren't any drugs that we know of right now that will very selectively modulate those pathways. And so that's a, that's a big challenge. But there are ways of addressing these issues because if you, if you go from the list of credible autism genes and you, you go beyond the top one, two, three, four genes on the list and you move down the list, you start to see that you're finding mutations in some patients that do directly point to a potential treatment. That's exciting. That's an approach that we're really trying to, to pursue here at UCSD, and that is to take, um, so to use the statistical criteria to say what's an autism gene, but then to not rely exclusively on the statistical criteria. Let's, let's bring in some common sense in terms of what of the genetic findings are really the ones that can be exploited to identify new treatments. And even if that's maybe number 37 on the list, let's focus on that gene because perhaps there's a biotech company in the Bay Area who has a treatment that could potentially be used on this very small population. But it's, you know, in essence, that is personalized medicine. That is taking the genetic finding and determining what is the logical treatment and, and matching that patient up with an appropriate drug. All right, so personalized medicine being the process by which you find a genetic abnormality <clears throat> and you let that inform your choices of whether there are drugs that you might use, what therapies might make most sense, but also it opens up this very exciting experimental possibility of now defining what that variant really does to a neuron or to a cell. So what are we doing here that looks toward the future of being able to make those perhaps very rare diagnoses and actually turn them into therapies? Well, so Personalized medicine, at least the way it's operating in 2017, is it's an interesting mixture of trying to directly influence care, but also simultaneously gaining a basic understanding of how the mutation influences development of the brain. And the way that we're doing this is that we take the finding, start to deeply characterize the patient and understand how the mutation relates to their clinical features. But simultaneously, thanks to new genome editing technologies that make it really uh, efficient to introduce the child's mutation into uh, a stem cell or a mouse or a fish, uh, we can now take these new technologies and put the patient's mutation into a mouse. And we can now have a personalized mouse model of the patient, which allows us to start doing preclinical studies of whether or not First of all, you know, are there clear effects of the mutation on cognition? And can the drug that we hypothesize might work actually correct those impairments? And pretty good is, uh, <clears throat> pretty good and available is uh, much preferable to perfect and not available. <laughs> and so these models allow you to begin to think about treatments that would uh, normalize pathway function in the absence of a perfect mechanism. And that surely is a hopeful development in genomics for, for, the, for these disorders you study. I agree. If we can find a few compounds that modulate neurodevelopment in the way that we want it to, and we can understand real disease mutations and how they respond to these drugs, that's the, that's the the beginning of precision medicine. And now, you know, that begins with a drug for a very rare disease, a drug for a very small group of patients. But again, it may be relevant to some broader group of patients. We don't know yet, right? When we start to understand, we're able to connect the dots between that patient and, you know, another larger group of patients and understand that they have related 
neurodevelopmental deficits, then you may be able to apply that to, to a larger fraction of patients. The, the benefit of that treatment could be um, greater than you, you know, at first thought. We're excited about your work and very proud of what you're doing and, and, uh, and the great collaborations you have with your colleagues. Um, I'm more hopeful than ever that uh, autism is a disorder we can understand and treat and that we'll do it sooner rather than later. Thanks for being on the program. Thank you, Bill. It's been great to be here. Bill Mobley for The Brain Chapter.